work with Google as well um, in their education department. So um, I've been in the education and technology world for quite some time, um, and I really, really enjoy it, and I enjoy the work that I do at BrainPop as well. Um, so <clears throat> a little bit about um, BrainPop in general. As I said, we, we create these short little videos that explain things um, to kids in all different subject areas. And about two years ago, BrainPop, or two and a half years ago, BrainPop introduced GameUp, which is a game-based learning space that has a lot of different games that work in um, a lot of different subject areas uh, that we have kind of vetted. Um, we've vetted and, and we've curated the space. So it's not, um, not games that BrainPop has created, but they are games that we found online that we think are super high quality that uh, we've brought together under the sort of the BrainPop banner. And <clears throat> with the intent of getting teachers using games um, that that are well designed and that really help to teach, um, help kids practice specific skills, but also to help them understand concepts and a bit of systems thinking as well. And I'm going to go into some of those games in just a bit. Um, so my job at BrainPop though is to run the educators area, which helps provide support to teachers that use BrainPop. Um, but we'll move away from BrainPop now. We're going to talk a little bit more um, about games. So here's my agenda for today. We're going to talk a little bit about why games are important in 2013 um, in our entire culture and in education specifically. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what uh, BrainPop in GameUp is so that you get a sense of this, this portal and how it can be of value to you. Then we're going to talk about some of the different roles for games in education because it's, some people always think, oh, games are for skill and drill, but there's actually can be used in lots of different ways. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, we're going to talk about what the elements are of game design because after game play, the real synthesis and, and creation process happens when you have kids start designing games. And you've probably heard some buzz about that, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about best practice for implementing games in education. And I apologize for capitalizing my, capitalizing my I. Shouldn't have done that. Um, then we'll take a little reflection at the end um, for Q&A and adios. So um, I'm hopeful this will take about half hour or so. So why games? Games are now an enormous cultural force in the U.S. and around the world. The new report, this is from a year ago, said that the video game industry will reach $82 billion by 2017. Um, and that's global. For, for some comparison, domestic Hollywood um, gross for a year is about $10 billion, so it's, um, <clears throat> which is a much smaller number, of course, than $82 billion. But that's domestic as opposed to international. But the point is that this is a huge, um, a huge part of the entertainment world that is growing in importance for our economy. Um, and uh, it's only going to become more and more um, <clears throat> integral because companies and, and, and entertainers are always looking for ways to, ent to engage users. And there's more and more competition for engagement and for people's time. So games can be used to engage people because, of course, they're inherently interactive um, and fun if they're well designed. So there's this economic impact of games that makes them important. There's also now this very important cultural impact as well. Just about a year ago, the Museum of Modern Art in New York where where Caitlin and Emily are, and I'm usually there, I'm not there right now, they just installed 14 classic video games into the Museum of Modern Art. So people think, well, games, how is that art? Well, if you actually consider this as a medium um, that was really only began to be built with in you know, probably 30 or 40 years ago, there were a lot of really interesting choices that were made by people that designed early games um, to use this kind of limited medium, because at the time we're, you know, we're looking at an image now of Pac-Man, <clears throat> you could only put on certain, certain number of pixels onto a screen, and the memory chips that were used to load the program into were very, very small, so there had to be a real um, concise coding that was done. You know, they, made, they made choices, these game designers, um, and the impact of them is really, really significant. If you think about you know, Pac-Man that came out in you know, 1981, What's the impact of that? We see Pac-Man everywhere you know, 30, 35 years later. Um, and the, the, the mechanisms by which you play and the mechanics um, have been mirrored and, and brought into a lot of different interactive environments. So this is just an example of Pac-Man, but there's a lot of other games there as well, like Tetris and whatnot. And these games were all primarily designed for entertainment. Um, and as we've come to the current day, games are designed for much more than entertainment as well. 
Um, another really important reason to think about the, the importance of games in 2013 um, is a bit more nuanced. And, and this comes to those of us who teach in the humanities and think about um, you know, English and history and you know, why do we study history and why do we study English? Well, a lot of it is because stories and, um, and moments of historic, historic episodes tell us, tell us things that, that inform our values for how we need to um, operate in, in a global society and in a world. Um, and I read this book recently by a man named Doug Rushkoff um, called Present Shock, and it's a play on Alan Toffler's book from the 70s called Future Shock, where he said, you know, everything is preparing for the future, and we'll have kind of who's projecting on the the, the um, creation of the internet and kind of being always on, and 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 the way that we uh, we <clears throat> excuse me, the, the way that we will interact and, and engage in the future will be slightly different. And, or significantly different. And Doug Rushkoff is saying, hey, you know what, we're in the future now. Like, we have these devices. We're always on. We're being pinged in the moment by other people. There's so much information that we have immediate access to that, you know, because of our psychological builds as humans, we have different relationship to the world now. Um, and he thinks one, one quotation that you're seeing on the screen now um, is really what spoke to me because he was talking about how games can be values uh, can be transmission, can help for transmission of values. And of course, we've looked for movies and books to do that through the era. And of course, religion is all based on stories. And those stories have values based in them and morals. And we listen to those stories and we're engaged in those stories. And hopefully those guide us to do the right thing as we become older and, and we become active um, you know, members of society and, and you know, Democrats, not Democrat or Republican, but Democrat is in participating in a democracy. Um, I'll just read the quotation. Computer games come to the rescue of a society for whom books, TVs, and movies no longer function as well as they used to. They engage players in open-ended fashion and communicate through experience instead of telling. So you know, those of us who have been in progressive education for a long time know you can't just tell people things and they learn it. You know, that's, the, that's the sage on the stage uh, approach to education. But in fact, we need to give kids experiences where they discover and, and uncover meaning and, and make meaning. Um, and so games can really allow us to do that if they're well designed um, with good intent in mind. So um, it's a really interesting book. I highly recommend reading it if uh, you're not that interested in games or what I'm talking about. It's just he's got a very interesting and keen insight into uh, the current state of our culture and our world. So let's think about games specifically because um, he's talking about transmitting values, using them well. Well, a well-designed learning game is highly engaging. I mean, we often have the vision of kids using controllers and being stuck in front of the computer or TV screen for, for hours on end, either shooting things up or you know, in one of these online, massive online games where they're interacting with other people. But they're super highly engaging and can, can in fact, become addictive. Um, but a well-designed game, of course, is highly engaging, and that's what, uh, that's what gets you to play it. Um, a good learning game is full of great content. So depending on whatever subject area um, and it, you're, you're working in, a, a well-designed game will, will incorporate a lot of the subject content into it. It's also a safe space for risk-taking and failure. Um, a well-designed game will let you mess up and start over again and will encourage you to do that. And that's, of course, one of these 21st century skills that you know, we hear a lot about in you know, all these new media conversations about kids need to be able to take risks and, and fail and, and, and build resilience and whatnot. And, and games are very safe spaces for doing that because no one's judging you. You'll just try again. Um, that also creates motivation for a, a player to persevere. Um, if, you are, if you've played through a few levels of a game and you get comfortable with the mechanics and understanding how to play it and you get to a level that's difficult, you know, you've already invested this time and energy into the first level. So often, if you've gotten that far to a place where it's hard, you are going to be motivated to try to persevere and get through. And if that motivation and the perseverance is connected to a learning objective, what a terrific way, what a terrific way of getting across um, a concept or a skill. Games are also always centered around a problem or, and are, are, are problem solving. You know, if there was no goal and no obstacle to the goal, it wouldn't be a game. It would just be doing something. But a well-designed game um, you know, articulates the problem clearly and has the, um, has the player work actively to solve that problem. 
Um, and also super well designed games you know, have, can allow you to enter that flow state. And we think about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development um, where we think about what a child can do on their own is one thing, but what a child can do with scaffolding or a student can do with scaffolding, they can go much, much farther. And games, if they're well designed, can provide incredible scaffolding um, because just due to the nature of what games are. Um, and most importantly, a well designed um, game can be fun. And um, learning should be fun. It's not always fun. Learning is a tremendous amount of hard work and it's difficult. And if it was always fun and easy, we wouldn't be learning anything. But um, by using games, we can incorporate fun into things that may have been difficult um, otherwise. So those are some of the kind of design principles of a well-designed learning game. So when BrainPop goes out and looks for games to put onto GameUp, which I said is our little curated educational space, we look for games that, have, that are defined and will be highly engaging, that frame the problem effectively, um, that are fun, that can be played during a class period, um, all sorts of things like that. And what we've done is we've said, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to look for games. Because anyone who knows, you know, if you've gone and Googled math games or fraction games, you'll come across you know, hundreds if not thousands of different games that have been produced to help um, teach a specific skill or, or help a kid understand a concept. Um, but a lot of them are not particularly w well done. Um, so we're tr at BrainPop we're saying, hey, you've trusted us to create content for a number of years. Well, trust us too because we've gone through these games. Um, we have a really detailed rubric we use when we're evaluating them. Um, and we'll only put ones up there that we think are really well designed um, and that will be effective for you as teachers. So this is a portal. Um, and it's free. It's not something you have to pay for. And to some of the games I'll share today are on, or all the games are on GameUp, but you can also find them in other places online. They're not exclusive to GameUp. Um, the other thing about these games on GameUp is that we've created teacher support materials, and specific lesson plans, um, specific, specific essential questions that you can ask, um, guidance for where kids may get confused, um, little screen, screen casks that show you how the game is played, and all sorts of things. So that's um, kind of the plug for GameUp as an entry point into to a lot of the games that I've described um, prior, or that, that are um, designed with a lot of the principles that I described prior. Um, so now we're going to talk about some specific games. Um, this is a, a visual of a game called um, Battleship Number Line. And this is a game that on a very basic level allows you to practice um, a, and, and build a skill. And you can see on this image it says level one of two. And down at the bottom it says, ship spotted at 110, and that thing at 1 tenth. And we see here is a number line. So my job to, is to estimate where 1 tenth is on this number line. And when I click there, it will drop a little, little missile, and if, um, if the ship is there, it will blow it up, and I'll get a, little, a few points. And this is a game, it's incredibly simple. Estimate, click, you're right or you're wrong, and you get a little bit of feedback. And this one is with um, fractions. We also have it with decimals. Um, or not we, the game is designed with decimals as well. Or you can choose what the numbers are on the number line. Um, here's an example of saying, hey, here, there's the little um, ship near the zero, and you have to put in your estimate. So what is the fraction? What would you say that is? Maybe, you know, 1 20th or 1 10th, and you type it in there, and you click fire, and you see yes, if it works. Oh, no, I'm just listening to it. Um, oh, if someone's, uh, someone may have to turn their mute on, I just heard a, a little. Um, so, uh, so my, my point is that this is a game where you can you just practice estimating. Incredibly good. Uh, Hearing a little feedback there, you can turn their mute on. That would be great. Yes. Um, I hope everyone is not hearing the same. I'm hearing, if you are. Oh, sounds like it's been muted. Very good. Um, so number, Battleship Number Line allows you both to estimate where a fraction is and also produce the fraction and click fire. And it's an estimation game and a fraction game. And it really promises to do nothing other than that. Um, but it's fun. And it's got this little timer and gives you feedback. Um, and it's very, very simple in its concept. Um, other games that are, are slightly more advanced are concept building games. This is a game called Budget Hero. Um, and this game was designed by um, American Public Media. And 
it's a game that was built during all the budget crisis showdown in Congress where um, people were talking about austerity and you know, cutting budgets and this and that. This game, you actually have to go through and create a budget. So if you don't understand what the concept of a budget is, this is a game that puts you in the, sh in the, in the shoes of a policymaker that must design a budget. And in the beginning, you have to choose, oh, what is my, you know, I'm actually going to show it to you. So I'm going to come out of here, um, put on to Budget Hero, it's right here. Can you guys see this okay? Um, I, mean, I hope so. I'm, I'm going to skip the briefing just uh, and so it says, the game starts 10 years from now to show the effects of the current policy if it were to continue on unchanged. Your main challenge, push back the budget bus date as far as possible. So you have to start by identifying what is of value to you. So are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Is health and wellness most important? National security? And green? Having a safety net? That happens? Um, having an efficient government? And once you choose those things, you have to drag them over to edges areas. I could say, I'm concerned with national security, I'm concerned with being green, and I'm concerned with energy independence. And once I click start, this brings me into the budget space. And you can see these little um, lines popping up. Of course, my job right now is to try not to bust the budget 10 years from now. And right now, it's 2022, this is what the budget looks like. Right now it's 2013. We've got a bit of a um, deficit, not a surplus, um, and I'll bust in 2033. So once I click on a certain region of government, like military, defense and diplomacy, up comes a bunch of cards that I can play. And I can go through them and say, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to freeze military spending? Do I want to rapidly cut war-related spending? Do I want to cut military spending in general? And when I click on one, it will give me a little feedback about it, what the pros and the cons are. And then I can choose, okay, I want to play this card. And I pop it over there. And because I've done a bit of a, um, a budget tweak and I've reduced $487 billion from the budget, my entire um, defense and diplomacy budget goes down. Okay? If I click over here on science and nature, I click here. It's, on this side, it shows me different ways um, that I can cut the budget. Um, I can also choose to fund it more because some of my goals are to be um, green and efficient. I may want to say, you know, uh, funds by half, something like that. Okay, so I'm going to pop that in there. Um, that's going to make my budget go up a little bit, right? Because I'm going up. Um, I can also click here for taxes. And when I do that, it says there's different kind of taxes that I can put So remember, there was a lot of talk about keeping the Bush tax breaks for the wealthy. So I can go through here and it gives me a list, um, extend payroll tax cut. I can put whatever I want in. I can just play it. Or, um, and then when I click to see how your budget backs up, this shows me what it's going to look like many years from now. So it's giving me back in the moment. I'm learning a little bit about the different things that go into creating a federal budget. So there's a you know, tremendous amount of... Um, and, and social studies here, um, great way of actually getting into the shoes, I said, of a policymaker and seeing the difficult decisions that need to be made because often people want everything. They say, I want a green planet. I want tough defense. I want the best for education. I want this. I want that. Of course we want it all, but we have to make difficult decisions. And this game, I can really learn that or at least put myself into the shoes of a policymaker trying to accomplish this. Um, so that's budget here, which is a game that really is a concept. I understand the concept it and a lot of the concept um, through playing this game. Let's see how my, step, my budget stacks up. If I click here, going time. Oh, I've got a big bit and all right. My 10-year budget, no match for me. I reduced debt. But I didn't get any of my budgets. I didn't get national security, I didn't build green, and I didn't build um, energy um, independence. So if I wanted, I could click edit my budget, or I could click play again. Um, I'm showing you the very abridged version, and of course, this is for adults, all of us who understand some of the things that go into a federal budget a little bit more than students may. So you may present this within the context um, of conversations about federal budgets. Um, or you could even at a certain point in history. 
um, and how you could maybe play out uh, budget allocation during that time. So there's a lot of ways of using this, but it really gives the concept of building a budget. Um, you make this big again. So that's a concept building. Um, also system building game. Systems building. This is a game called Guts and Bolts. And this is a game, you know, we're moving from social studies now into um, science and body systems. Teach about body systems, a game that could show you a little bit about how they're all interrelated. Um, and this game is about interrelating and connecting different parts of the body system. So you have to connect your nervous system to your respiratory system to your digestive system to your nervous system. So you have to connect all the different body systems. As you go through the different levels, um, you start with one system and then you move on and you have to connect them all. So you can see in the image on the left, this is level three, where I'm just learning about my nervous system and there's a brain. And because it's about connecting things, it uses a plumbing metaphor. So I actually have to lay pipe between um, all these different nutrients. You can see it's oxygen, nutrients, and carbon dioxide. They go into one side of the brain and then out is going to come carbon dioxide. And is that exactly what happens to a brain and to the different air and nutrients we eat and um, breathe in? Not exactly. It's giving me the sense that there's an input and there's an output. And all of our systems have inputs and outputs, but they have to connect in a certain way so that they're, they don't get messed up. I wouldn't want to be pumping um, you know, blood that's been out of my, uh, out, out, that doesn't have any oxygen in it um, down to different body. I want, I want those to come back through, through my veins, not my arteries. So you need to think about how these, these uh, systems are connected. And you get to do that, play and tinker around with it through, um, through laying all these pipes. You're learning the interconnections between the system. Um, so you can see the image on the left is just the nervous system, but here on the right we've got the respiratory and the digestive system. And I've got a lot of different pipes going in and out. And this one's super fun. When you mess up, and you lay the pipe in the wrong direction, you see like blood popping out and it's kind of, but in a, in a playful and fun way, not a, not a gratuitously violent or, or gratuitously disgusting way. Um, so it's a great into talking about how body systems are connected, and thinking about it and understanding that concept that body systems are connected. They don't all operate independently. Um, only metaphor helps. Um, another great systems game is a game created by ICE. This is a, this is a game design group that comes out of the federal government. And this game is called Executive Command. And in this game, you actually have to take the role of the president. And you give a state of the union, you choose a, um, an agenda for your, for your four years. And then as soon as you choose your agenda, you've got to go pitch it to Congress. And then once you pitch it to Congress, they like things and they start sending you different bills or they don't like things and they send you other bills. Um, and you have to start signing stuff or vetoing stuff. Then a war breaks out, so you've got to go to the Pentagon and talk to them. And then there's an education crisis, so you have to go to the Department of Education. Then you have to go to the Department of Defense, Department of Aviation. You get the sense of what the different responsibilities that the president has in a, in a, in a simulated way. Can I, can I play this game and go become the president? Of course not. But can I play this game and then understand some of the responsibilities that my president has? Yes. And in fact, you learn because you have to get, uh, you get different bills sent to you from Congress and then you have to send them back to get Senate. You realize that you're not always making the, the, the laws. You are either vetoing or, or approving um, things that are sent to you. So a lot of people, you know, a lot, big misconception is that kids, kids think that, you know, the president makes the laws. They don't make the laws. They have to um, either approve or disapprove of the laws that are pitched to them um, by Congress. And then they have to the day, the, if they're proven unconstitutional by the, by the Supreme Court, then it goes back to ground one. So there's an interconnectedness, of course, um, in our federal government, three branches. Um, and this gives you a great sense of not the legislative, the judicial, but the executive branch. It's called executive command. It's a great game. It takes about 25 minutes a day. Um, and it's perfect if you're teaching about the responsibilities of the president. Um, so going on in thinking about, you know, we, we talked about games that can help kids build skills and practice things. We talked about concept building in games like, um, like Budget Hero. We talked about systems thinking, like the systems connected in your body or the systems that you need to um, navigate and, and understand the president. But also games have value. 
of course, anything that's produced, a book or a, or a, or a movie, there's usually a value of or any sort of media is, that is explicitly stated or implied through it because the person that created the movie or the, or the book or the game has certain values. It's a game called IET, The Life, which was designed um, by UNICEF and a group called Global Kids um, with input from students um, about life in Haiti. And in this game, you have to choose if your goal for the game is to be healthy, if your goal for the game is to be educated, if your goal for the game is to be happy or the goal to make a lot of money. Um, so it's, you sit down here on the lower right, playing strategy. Um, so you have to choose that in the beginning. And then, of course, as you play, you start recognizing that in order, in order to become well-educated, um, you need to have money to pay for a good school because um, some of the schools at least in the are, are, are very poor. And that's are, are poor, not financially poor, but not, not high quality. Um, but, of course, um, to get money, you need to have a good job. And to get a good job, you need to be educated. So you start seeing how health, education, money, and happiness are all really very interconnected, even though you've chosen one strategy. In the and this is a turn-based game where you have to choose every season. You click on one of these little characters, and you either send them to school, or you send them to work, um, or you send them to the hospital if they're sick. And they all have happiness meters and education meters um, and health meters, and the goal is just to survive in season. Um, and playing this game and watching your characters die because they don't um, have enough health because they've been working difficult jobs um, or because they get pneumonia or certain and they can't go get help um, can be um, an emotional experience. And having played this, I played this with my fourth grader um, when I was in the classroom or when I was a technology integrator, I should say. And some of the conversations that came out of playing this game were, were very, very meaningful um, insofar as the connection between opportunity that comes with money and um, health and, and education. Um, and the fact that it, you know, not everyone is as privileged as growing up in parts of the United States where you have access to decent education and decent health and, and money and happiness. So this way is also building empathy to a degree. And this game um, communicates values in that way. That's really the intent of the game, is to have you think about these connections. Of course, it's also a system, it's also a concept, and it's also skill building. So part of the work that I'm presenting today, being that there's skill building and concept and systems and, and values, is that the best, it's a really good way just to talk about games. I can't say that, you know, uh, that Budget Hero is simply a concept building game because it's also a systems game and it also teaches skills. So, but those are different ways that we can be begin quantifying or, or, and thinking about um, how we're using games um, in, in our classrooms. So, of course, they're all up for debate um, and the way that I'm talking about them is up for debate, but the value of bringing them in for all of these different reasons um, to me is... Um, so that's a little bit about different ways of thinking about games that you may bring into your classroom. Of course, the next step after um, playing games and, use, and kind of deconstructing them and understanding how they work and why they're fun or why they're good is to do um, game design. Um, this is a, um, still a screen grab from a, a, a software that's called, it's actually a web-based, it's not, it's not software that you install on your computer, but it's a web-based program that's called GameStar Mechanic. And GameStar Mechanic is a game design platform that's actually built as a game. So the first level, um, well, the context, the space for the games that you are in a um, factory, you're in a game factory, and all the games are broken, hence the name GameStar Mechanic. So your job is to be a mechanic and fix the game, or all the different games. So the first game that you're going to fix doesn't have an ending, has no goal. So you have to you recognize, oh, all games have a goal. Um, and you get the little gold symbol that you can then use when you're building your own game. Um, as you move up, you realize that, oh, all, the, you know, all games have obstacles, because if I could just walk to my goal, there's not a lot of game, to, there's not a lot of game quality to that. Um, so you start bring, getting more um, obstacles and, and different things. So all games in general have a space. So what I was talking about uh, in Game Star Mechanic, the space is a, is a, game, uh, a, game, uh, a game factory. Um, it has components, so you're a little character, and you know, you're going and you're playing games, and you're collecting different things that you can use on your own games. 
Um, there's things like mechanics. Mechanics are things like, oh, I can jump in this game, or I can run, or I can shoot, or I can talk. And those are all different mechanics. Goals, of course, are what the end goal of the game is. Um, and some are very explicit, like in uh, Budget Hero, when you need to um, balance the budget for 20 years out, or in IET, where you need to survive for four years. Other games are much more um, are, are, are much more exploratory. So one very popular big game that you can't play in 20 minutes, but that you can play in about four or five hours is called Civilization. And that's a game where you're simply building civilization. Goals just to build a civilization, but you can build it in all sorts of different um, Games have rules. If there were no rules, people would get upset with each other and not really want to play. It kind of makes it not fun. So if I'm playing tic-tac-toe and I can write two um, you know, two symbols in a row, that kind of breaks the rules and makes it not as much fun. So all games have rules. So when you're thinking about going from play with students to game design with students, you have to think about this kind of system. And there's a tremendous amount of information out there about game design with students. I'm not going to focus on it too much more right now because this is more about play and using games in education rather than game design. The reason I mention it is because I think it's, an, it's a really valuable, um, really valuable exercise and project to do with students when you're using games because it has them become the creators rather than just the consumers of the game. And if they understand how good games are designed and they start building them themselves, it's actually a deep look into psychology. Um, because if a game is too hard or a game is too easy, it's not fun and no one wants to play it. But if a game is just, um, you know, you've hit on something that's very human. Um, so that's a little bit about time and the importance of it. Um, this is a game that I wanted to play with you guys, called Lord of the Labyrinth. I think I'm running a little bit late, so I'm going to um, I'm going to kind of skip that. But this is a game that you can find on on uh, on Brain Pop's Game Up, and it's actually a game that you see numbers and food and little coins. It actually teaches you to solve for x without even thinking about it. So I encourage you, if you've got a little time on your hands after today's webinar, go check out Employee Lounge on uh, Lore of the Labyrinth, which is on Game Up, um, and tinker around and see what you can figure out through playing it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty great game. Um, so I wanted to put a space in here because, of course, we're thinking about games as, as teaching certain things and helping kids get, gain access to information. Um, and so, of course, because we're on an easy bib um, webinar, I thought I would allow Emily or, or Caitlin to speak a little bit about how you might cite a game. So if I'm, if, you know, if I'm creating a project about federal budgets and I'm playing Budget Hero, I may need to cite that game because it taught me something that I'm then writing about or you know, adding to a video that I'm creating or a presentation. So I'd hand it over to, um, to either Caitlin or Emily just for a second to talk a little bit about how you would cite games if you're using them for different projects. So can I pass it off to you guys? Okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, thanks, Andrew. There are some formal and official formats that you can use for citing certain types of games. Um, of course, computer software has been around for decades now, and that does have a formal citation formatting for APA, MLA, and Chicago Turabian, and that's all available on EasyBib. Um, additionally, video games can be cited in MLA and APA. They have a formal uh, type of format for that. Chicago encourages you to sort of adapt the video recording format to a video game. So there's nothing formally set in stone, but they do have a suggested method of citing video games um, in Chicago Turabian style. Despite the growing popularity of apps, um, there are no formal or universal citation formats for mobile apps yet. Um, there are options for citing online software on EasyDisk. Um, and depending on the citation style that you're using, some of them do ask for detailed descriptions of the software used. Rather than talking about what the functions of the game are, it's probably better for you um, to specify the device or console or operating system that was used to access the device. So in this case, you say I was using an iPhone application, I was playing something on Xbox, so on and so forth. Um, so that's just a little bit of background info for you. Um, back to you, Andrew. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I just thought that was an important thing to mention because, of course, we're talking about citation. Um, and all of you clearly are interested in that because you're uh, um, users of, of EasyBib, um, which, incidentally, I used when I was 
in the classroom. Um, and incidentally, also we have a nice um, easy bib biography or bibliography, sorry, that uh, Emily created um, that has a lot of different additional research and um, resources and whatnot for you to refer to um, after today's webinar. Um, because of course I'm speaking from my own personal experience and some of the reading and um, knowledge building that I've done over the years, but there's a tremendous amount of stuff out there. And uh, so, so uh, we, have a, we have a bibliography that we will share. Um, um, that kind of brings me towards the, the conclusion. Um, and I, I hope you get a sense just by talking through, um, through, through thinking about games from a perspective of skill building, from concept building, from systems building, from thinking building, and um, from values transmission, um, I, I hope that gives you a new vocabulary with which to think about games and which, with, with which to talk about games. Um, I'm curious, you know, a little bit, it's hard to talk as a large group of, you know, dozens or hundreds of people. I'm not sure how many people are out there. But I think it's important to ask yourself, you know, what excites you about using games with students and what concerns you about using games with students? Um, and then if you are interested in trying this, to identify a management goal for helping you move ahead <clears throat> implementing games in your education setting. So I, think, I, I always like to say that at the end of any um, situation where you're presenting a new concept or a new idea because it's a big idea and it's really hard to then say, hey, I'm going to go implement this big idea. But you can start with a small piece of that big idea. So you might say, hey, you know, I liked that game that Andrew showed um, about um, you know, Battleship Number Line, so maybe I'll go play it. That's, that's a manageable goal because you could go spend about 10 minutes after today and do it, and that would be a first step. If you're already familiar with games, you may say, you know what, I want to go and find a game that I'd like to use um, in the library you know, during you know, the American Revolution um, unit for, for seventh grade this year. That might be something that's also a manageable goal. I mean, it's tangible, actionable, um, and it can have something that uh, you, know, you can follow through at a reasonable amount of time and, and, and get something done. So if you are interested in this, I definitely recommend identifying a manageable goal. Don't just say I'm going to start using games in education or in my class because that's really what <laughs> um, uh, you know, a, a few A few bits of information just about you know, what, what uh, if you are excited, some things that can help is a lot of people enjoy using games um, as, as homework um, or as something that kids can do um, on their own time, and then you come back during school the next day and everyone's had access to a game and the ability to play it, um, and then that becomes an entry point into a conversation. Or sometimes people like to play a game with the entire class on a smart board or on a projector 15 minutes and just use that again as an entry point into a discussion. Um, so those are two little quick tips that can be used. You know, of course, a lot of people think about you know, going to a computer lab or in a one-to-one -one environment, having all the kids play at the same time. Um, I think it's really important to provide um, students guidance if you're going to do that. Um, and those, that's more of a classroom management conversation, I think, it is, than, than a games and education um, conversation. A lot of ways that you can implement a one-to-one -one setting where kids are uh, more directed in using the technology mindfully and effectively. Um, and if you've established culture and that relationship with technology in your educational setting, then it shouldn't be that difficult to um, bring, bring games in. Um, a lot of the games I showed today are web-based, and that's important to know that there's been many, many years of people building educational games, um, and a lot of them have been designed for the web. You know, our, our app ecosystem that we're pretty excited about um, in education, um, and there's a lot of money and interest in, um, is still being built out. So you know, though a lot of the developers of these games have created phenomenal games, they've not yet gotten the finances to actually port them from Flash, which is the web-based version of these games, into either HTML5, which works on these iOS devices, or into an app version where you can just launch directly into the game. So we're, there's sort of a transition point in some educational games because of that. Um, and so it's just important to, to recognize that. Um, and most of what's on BrainPop's Game Up are all web-based. So not most of it, everything. 
Um, there's a few examples of a couple of the games that have also been created within apps. But uh, of course, the, the interesting thing for educational game publishers, especially the good ones, is a lot of them come out of universities for, you know, and education schools where people are really thinking about what's an engaging experience and how can I express uh, you know, these learning goals and expectations through this game. They're built within universities and they're often done on a grant. And of course, they build a game and then the grant money runs out and then the game kind of lives on a server somewhere, but it, it's, it's not actively maintained because they run out of money. So, um, so that's just saying that a lot of these games, that, and a number of them actually on, on Game Up have been kind of saved from a, a languishing space um, where they were not getting much attention anymore. But uh, Bring Pop has helped attention to them. So that's a little bit, um, those are some sort of quick tips about games and thinking about using them and, and that the fact that these are web-based games and not app-based games. Um, so I thank you for taking the time to, uh, to be here today and to, to listen to me spiel. I hope you found it um, useful and effective. And I'm totally psyched to stick around for questions. Um, I don't know, Caitlin, Emily, if we're going to turn the uh, phones back on for that or, or people's mics or whether that should all be done through the chat room. Um, but uh, you, know, you, guys can, you can tell me that. Um, but it, you know, before that happens, just know if you ever have questions or comments, you can always find me um, at A. Gadna. I'm from Boston, so I have a Gadna sound <laughs> to my Twitter handle. Um, and I'm Andrew G. at BrainPop. You can always ask uh, questions to me there as well. And you know, I'm happy to stick around for some questions. I'm going to move out of that screen mode um, and go back and see. Let me uh, <clears throat> give the, the, the sharing back to Emily. Um, Thanks, Andrew. Um, that was a really informative and useful presentation. We have been getting some questions during uh, the webinar that I've been keeping track of, so I'll just be asking those questions on behalf of the participants, and then you can um, enlighten us with your answers. Um, before I get to the questions for you, there was one question earlier on. Uh, somebody asked, is the presentation going to be available through email after today's presentation, and will there be a certificate verifying attendance that can be used for professional development? Yes to both of them. We will be uh, sending out a recording of today's webinar in a follow-up email along with a certificate of completion. And the webinar will also be up on YouTube, so if you want to share it with any of your friends or colleagues, uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, Andrew, one of the first questions that came up earlier on in the presentation asked, uh, what is the rubric you use to decide which games are well designed and is it available online? It's, it's actually interesting. We spent a long time building the rubric and um, we actually presented on how we did it at the Games Learning and Society conference back in uh, June. The uh, Games Learning and Society is a, is a research group out of University of Wisconsin. And it was a pretty careful um, sort of collection of looking at what the learning objectives are and making sure that the game mechanic, like what you're actually doing in the game, is connected to what the learning objective is. For example, like Guts and Bolts is a good example because you're thinking about connecting body systems. So what's the mechanic? You're laying pipe. That's, there's, a, there's an alignment between what you're doing and what, your, um, what, what the learning objective is. Um, there's a lot of games out there where like, oh, you know, I have to shoot the fraction or this and that, which really doesn't have a lot to do with understanding the concept of a fraction. Battleship number line is different because you see, oh, I'm on a number line. I've got to click where the fraction is on that number line, and that's what creates the shot. Not just, um, it's not a mechanic that's totally unrelated to the, the learning objective. So that's a really, really important. Um, other pieces are that, um, that uh, they're, all of them, in fact, are playable within a, within a 45 minute class period. Most of the gameplay is usually about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, some are shorter. Um, and that was important because we knew that teachers wanted to be able to play games within a class period. Or if you want to send it home for homework, you want to make it a reasonable amount of time. Um, there's plenty of amazing games that you can play over hours and hours and hours that can teach you incredible things. Civilization is a great example of um, but we didn't want to put those ones on um, BrainPop's game up. Um, the answer to the question directly, the rubric is not available online. 
um, as of yet. And I, I don't know if that's something that we're planning on putting out there or not. But it has been presented on at the Games Learning and Society Conference. So if you look at the, I think it's GLS group, or if you just Google GLS, you know, University of Wisconsin, you'll see the proceedings from um, there from the, the conference this, this spring. And uh, you, should, you may be able to find some information associated with it there. So it's a great question. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we did get a couple of questions specifically relating to the games that you can find through GameUp. Um, one person asked, uh, can the games from GameUp be embedded into websites? Another asked, uh, do the games have recommended uh, age or grade indicators? And are these games aligned with Common Core? Okay, so um, I am going to put a link. Actually, let me share my screen for a second again because I want to show you um, all the sort of support content that we have for a lot of our games. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, you know, here's the example of uh, Budget Hero. I hope can you guys see okay? It looks good, Andrew. Okay, terrific. So if I go down here to Budget Hero and I play this, um, I click this button that says Lesson Ideas. This will click me through to all the support materials we have for teachers. Um, and this is something that this is what I this is my work um, at BrainPop because I create. I help uh, manage BrainPop educators. So we have a specific um, page of content surrounding each game. So if I go here, it shows me some pictures from Budget Hero. It tells me a little bit about Budget Hero. Down here there is a um, lesson plan, which when I click through will tell me the ages that it's um, appropriate for. Um, and it's also it tells me that the lesson plan is aligned to Common Core State Standards. I can also look right up here. And my Common Core alignments will appear right here. We knew that was very, very important for a lot of teachers, especially going into this year, um, knowing that the uh, online assessments may begin next year. I know that's getting more and more up in the air. <laughs> but uh, so there is Common Core alignment. There's not Common Core alignment with every single game and every single Brain Pop, um, you know, video. If you're familiar with Brain Pop videos, because not all of them um, are uh, make sense within the, the sort of verb action based. Um, way that the, the Common Core are written. But I in fact think the games and the lesson plans are much more meaningful alignments than the Brain Pop you know, movie about fractions. Because the Brain Pop movie about fractions you watch and it could present some information, but there's, no, there's not a lot of ac action and activity involved in the same way <clears throat> that there is um, if you either play a game because it's interactive or if you're a teacher and you're presenting a lesson plan that has a really clear scope and sequence that may have kids actually do things. Um, so on this page, Common Core, click through here, I'll see all the essential questions that can help guide um, <clears throat> some of the game. Um, let's see cards. These are the cards that you see in the game, and you can print them out. Um, come from the game, there's more. Um, and here's the actual lesson, which is written in a very any kind of approach with objectives, real vocabulary that's defined, uh, the preparation, the procedure, um, and any additional. So uh, that's the plan. Of course, up here it also tells us which design. Um, on, on Brain Pop, I'll just go to the regular Brain Pop site. Most of the games that are sort of geared towards third, fourth grade and up, you can click Game Up here, and it will bring you to the Game Up where you can then pick areas. Um, if you want games for young, so if I go to uh, BrainPopJr.com, click the Game Up button here, which is right here, it will bring me. Game up fewer games on Brain Pop than there are on regular Brain Pop, but that's because we've only launched this about uh, two months ago, so it's still new. But we're constantly, as I said, vetting games, um, identifying which ones are best, and putting them up there. So it's growing. So I guess that that, uh, that addresses. You know, age level addresses Common Core. Other thing that you asked, Emily, I don't remember if I addressed that or what it was. Uh, the other one was if the games can be embedded into websites. Excellent question. Yeah, um, they cannot be embedded from Game Up, but 
like you can see here, the, uh, the Simple Machines game is from the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. So in some cases, the games um, on the original website have embed codes, and if they have embed codes, you can embed them on your page, on your Edmodo or whatever you're choosing to use. Um, they, we do not provide embed codes from, um, from GameUp. So um, you'd have to go to the original game publisher, which you're absolutely entitled to do. Um, the thing about GameUp is that we're just wrapping these games in kind of a brain pop paper, and down at the bottom in the movies, relate to the game is exploring. This is a game where think of both gravity, because those are all um, key to the, the concept of it. Um, so that's, uh, but if I wanted to see if this was, um, if this was embeddable, I could go to Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, look for the game. This is a good example. I've never done this. A simple machine. Here's the game. See if there's an embed code here. Um, it, so this game does not have an embed code. Some do. Um, I don't have a list, but it's actually a good, I should make one. But it's a good. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, Couple more questions. Um, we've had some people asking if there are any games on GameUp that relate to research skills or information literacy instruction. Um, do you know if GameUp has anything like that available? Um, one of our partners um, is uh, Common Sense Learning, Common Sense Media. Some of you may know of Common Sense Media. Um, <clears throat> they are kind of a go-to place to evaluate kids' media sites. And that's sort of how they built their brand a few years ago. And since then, they've started developing uh, digital citizenship curriculum, a search curriculum. One of the games um, is uh, Search Shark, Share Jumper. Those are both games that um, encourage, they're from Common Sense. They're both games that encourage you to think about what makes sense to share when you're online. So like, it's, a, it's kind of a decision-making game. And you have to share, like, oh, am I going to share, like, hi, my name is Andrew and I'm 37? Or am I going to say, hi, my name, my name is AG and I work in, you know, and I'm in my 30s. So it kind of makes you differentiate between being explicit and being more general. That's ShareJumper. And Search Shark um, kind of prompts you to think about what's the best way to search for a certain amount of information, um, you know, on Google and that kind of stuff. So those are two. Um, sort of search literacy and, and online literacy games, um, not so much about researching um, skills, but you know, kind of tap into that. I highly recommend looking at uh, Common Sense Media. I think they're a terrific content creator um, and are just, you've got a lot of smart people there that are really thinking through a lot of the issues um, that we're facing using technology and, and uh, sort of the wild west of the online world with, with young students. Um, and they've created both support content for teachers and things like Search Shark and Share Jumper, which are games games for kids. I highly recommend taking a look. Um, so that's a long-winded answer of saying we don't have research skills games. Those so Search Shark kind of address it a little bit. <laughs> awesome. Um, I did want to make a point that last week we had a professional development webinar um, that was presented by an academic librarian on gamification, and we have links to that presentation in the EasyBib bibliography that Andrew mentioned before. Um, there's tons of great resources for additional reading material on this topic, and we are going to be sending that out in the follow-up email as well. So if you are looking for more information literacy games, you can definitely check out that webinar um, with more resources to those types of games as well. Um, we are wrapping up, so just um, a couple more questions. Um, for you, Andrew. One person uh, said that the audio broke up when you were talking about Lure of the Labyrinth. So if you could just uh, summarize what it is that that game teaches, that would be great. Sure. Lure, Lure the, I'm sorry that, that it broke up. Uh, Lore of the Labyrinth, um, there's actually three different Lore of the Labyrinth games. Um, I'll, I'll show them real quick um, on, uh, on GameUp. And the one that I was showing was called Employee Lounge. And that's a game that as you actually solve for X, um, you have, you're prompted to put different coins to a, um, 
<clears throat> into a, uh, a machine, a vending machine. Um, I'm sorry, I'm typing in the same time. Uh, and uh, you have to, you start putting in different combinations and getting different things out of the, um, out of the vending machine. And of course, the goal is to get as many things out of the vending machine as possible, and you have to put in the right combination of coins to create a certain value. And so through the game and just through tinkering, um, you start recognizing like, oh, you know, the green coin means, you know, four units of money, and the, you know, red coin means six. Um, so it's, it's a game that helps you solve for X. Great. Okay. Um, we are